Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. So I kept getting a couple of emails to check out the new guitar auctions of Gardner Holgate, as we normally do, but it was Russell's message that gave me a link to the most crazy gold top that I think I've ever seen that made me want to make this. Sneak preview of that right here, but this auction's not a one day, not a two day, not a three day, but a four day affair here. So I went through all 100 pages and I selected the coolest things that I wanted to talk about. But feel free to look through it yourself and share anything that you think I might have missed in the comments. So obviously, we have to start off with the Big Mac Daddy. This is a 1952 Gibson Les Paul with a huge story. But before we get to that story, look at this thing. It is so disgusting, you can't help but love it. So it's no mystery here, gold tops turn green when they get all sweaty, they get the dirt and grime built up into them. It has to do with the powder in the finish, and the way it ages and reacts to all that stuff. And you generally get like heavy finish checking and stuff when you have high humidity. So that said, this thing must have been owned by some kind of a swamp monster. Because it's not just the fact that the finish has turned green and it's flaking off in many areas, it's knowing that this thing was likely heavily played at the same time. Perhaps it was more of a jazzy guy who sat down a lot and is just in entire body was corroding the Les Paul, but it's got a certain vibe to it, right? But trust me, my friends, the aged finish is only half the story on this one. Because only the body is original to this, it actually has a replacement neck that was crafted by a guy named Clive Brown. And now the profile is a slight V shape. Interesting. But being a 52, when you convert it from the original under wrap bridge, you have to adjust the neck angle, so it probably made sense to replace the entire neck if there was something else wrong anyways, or if the guy needed a different neck profile like it seemed like he wanted. So they've already updated that for us, and gave us the whole stop tail ABR1 conversion. But apparently they saved the original headstock logos, so that's good. And they even pried off the original fretboard to put it on the new one in the inlays, so everything's all right there, but obviously we had to refret it, and replace a few other things here and there. However, at least it looks like the neck was constructed properly. They did the wings, they didn't just make it out of one piece of wood, and I really like the wood grain that they've got going on here. Nice and wavy. But look at how big that heel is. Yeah, that definitely does not look like a Gibson made product anymore. But so much wear and tear on the back, this thing was loved. Even if it was abused, in quotations. And yep, this one's still happy to see us after all these years. So, how much is a crusty old gold top with a new neck worth? According to the auction house, they think it'll go between 10 to 12,000 pounds. Oh, and also don't forget, all these lots are subject to a buyer's premium of almost 30%, but that includes the value added tax. So essentially like 12 to 15,000 USD. I don't know, I think that one might be a little bit high. I mean, if this was a real 56 that left the factory looking like this, then I could definitely see it reaching towards those areas. But a new neck, that's a pretty big deal. So we'll have to see how that one plays out. Will its unique character and location in the world trump everything? Because it looks like it's got a newer Gibson case on top of all this. But that is one sick, and I mean literally sick gold top. Next up is one you don't see too often for sale. It's the Gibson Custom Shop Mark Knopfler 1958 reissue. They only made 150 of these in the VOS finish, and it's just a pretty nice looking Les Paul. It looks like it's got all the case candy that it should have, maybe even the original box, nice. And as far as the serial number, it looks like this one is number 70. Estimated somewhere in between here, we'll see what it goes for. Next up, similar to the Knopfler, we have a Jeff Beck. Wow, you don't see the aged version very often. This is a very desirable signature guitar. You don't see it too often. We've got the COA, the beautiful oxblood finish, even signed. Where do they have this one at? Oh yeah. <laughs> High estimates about 25,000 US, and yet they'll probably get something like that. Here is one that intrigued me, a 77 Les Paul Deluxe. I liked it because it was a bit of a goofball, like, their burst job was a little bit askew, I guess is the best way to put it, like to the left, because you almost have like no burst right here and just so much yellow, which is kind of a breath of fresh air because a lot of times the 70s ones are a little bit too clowny for my taste, like they're too bright red. So this one's definitely seen some sun time because the, all the reds almost added this thing. So maybe the red's just been bled out of it in this area and that's why it looks kind of strange. But, you know, sometimes things like that makes a guitar cool because you just have to appreciate it the way it has aged. But then you swap over to the backside and everything's looking about normal right here, but then our neck is still all bleached out. Like what on earth? I realize this is a mahogany body and this is a maple neck. The same finish will look different on these woods, but it's still sun faded just on the neck. That is strange. I like it though. But according to these guys, it's only slightly faded. <laughs> 
Now take a look at this guy. We can tell it's a 1972 because we've got the whole Gibson embossing on the pickups, but you might think, yeah, is that just a 335? No, this is the 335's bigger cousin. I love how obnoxiously big these things are. It's the ES-150. I want to document one because 335s, they're thin lines. They're supposed to be thin bodies, but these are like full bodied acoustic type stuff. They are big. This one's got a whole bunch of paperwork with it. Looks like maybe in some sort of a story. If you're going to get a 150, you might as well get one of these. Here's a Gibson US-1. We talked about these in this episode right here, and using the information we learned from there, we can tell that the single coils, yes, they are original. That's just what they do, they change colors. But it looks like our knobs have been replaced, but that's pretty common on those. And it is the nice ABR-1 stop tail version. But is it the one that has the flame on the back? Oh, it is. Nice. Not all of them have the flame maple cap on the back. And have it on the sides. But that's a pretty good example right there. And wow, their high estimate was 13? Nah, nah, nah. I mean, something like that, that nice. I mean, it looks like it's got somewhere, but bare minimum 2,500 USD. Because it still has the original case on top of it, too. It could fetch even up to like 35, 4,000 plus if the right person falls in love with it. This is another one that's estimated pretty low. I mean, they think the highest they're going to get is like 25. This will easily get it to 35, I would guess. This is one of the nice ones that has the walnut on the top and then the maple strip in the center. If you need to learn more about these, you can check out this video. But that, that's looking clean. There's no really good close-ups of the headstock. Ah, darn, factory second, but everything else is looking nice. I mean, if that's as clean as that looks, it, it might even bring 4,500. And day two has a whole bunch of like artist owned stuff, but this is the only one that really piqued my attention. Matt Owens of Noah and the Whale. He has a Gibson Dove from circa 1969, according to these guys, that they think it'll sell somewhere between here, which is ridiculously cheap for a 60s Dove. However, it looks like we've got some sort of a Gretsch pickup that was put in the bridge position to modify this one. There's some repaired cracks. That looks like a replaced pick guard to me. It might not be, I'm not 100% sure. It's definitely sun aged and well worn, but it's got the mid 60s truss rod cover style and that's what I love about those things. But hey, the maple back and sides, they have some okay figuring, nothing too crazy. But I approve of the green felt golf turf interior case. Next up, we have a Heritage Golden Eagle. So Heritage, you know, it's the old Gibson factory. They're cool. And Gibson back in the day was known for like their citations and really high-end stuff. So here we go. We've got a jazz box arch top here with a cool bird and your one control. But that's a beautifully dark spruce top here. That looks nice. Then you've got your cloud inlays here that then turn into blocks. And then you get your avian friend up here. I'm guessing that's supposed to be like an eagle? It's hard for me to tell because we start to lose definition once you get so close up in here. Gardner Holgate doesn't quite have the same resolution of photos as Heritage Auctions. Next up, we've got a customized Epiphone SG. I wanted to look at this one to see what they customized about it. So it looks like they put some sort of a burl veneer over top of it. I'm not sure what kind of wood, but that gives it an interesting vibe and it just makes it not look like an SG anymore. This is similar to what Epiphone was doing on the SGs. Like they just get whatever body wood that they want to use and then they put that sapele wood over it that just kind of looks like a flamed mahogany. So that's got similar vibes going on. But then they put a clear pick guard on top of that, which isn't quite the usual shape. But that way you're not scratching up your guitar, but you can still see through it. So far, I like these modifications. And then, oh, wow, that's one of the uh, late 80s Epiphones, I believe. I'd have to brush up more on the history, but there was a point in time or Epiphones had the open book headstock, believe it or not. But nice looking back here. What did they do? <laughs> so they have another veneer back here, but then they cut a back plate out of that veneer and then put a clear plate over top of that. Okay. Still a bolt on neck, but that's an interesting mod. I like older style knockoff guitars where they just kind of make their own unique version of something. Here's a 2007 apparently Tokai. I didn't know they were still in production. But obviously, they're trying to go for a Firebird. They don't quite have the exact dimensions, but they're pretty darn close. But I do like their headstock style. That looks really surprisingly good with this style tuning tips. Maybe that's what Gibson needs to try. Because generally, I like it when the Firebirds, they have their traditional banjo style tuners or the Steinbergers. But that looks pretty good. But ah, uh, that's where they get you. It's a bolt-on neck. But hey, let's not discount the absolutely insane case this thing comes with. That's nice. Billy Joe Armstrong would approve. Here's one I think people are sleeping on about this auction. Heavily modified 70 Stratocaster. In need of restoration. 
So let's see what's 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 going on here. <laughs> I love it. It's the first time I've zoomed in here. So we've got two output jacks on the front. Looks like some sort of Floyd-esque system put in here. One, two, three, four, five knobs, two different switches. We got two, four, five pickups that are all rusted over. And um, it looks like the neck is slightly smaller than normal. And now we've got these giant circular mother of pearl inlays with what looks like very, very shoddy fretwork, potentially. It's either that or it's just dirty. But then we have some unknown neck, essentially, here. You can bet your butt I would play that all day for that price. Well, it looks like we have at least one vintage pickup in here. It even has the bullet truss ride cover still on it yet. But okay, maybe the neck is still original because it's got the whole micro tilt adjustment type thing going on. That could be a lot of fun for someone. This is something that would be worth getting it up to snuff and going for it. This Korean made Telecaster called me because A, the wood grain looks nice, but we have abalone inlays on this. You just don't see that on Telecasters too often. So it's like, yeah, I like that. Good color, good wood grain, something unique. I'd play that one. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have an Indonesian made version of something I thought only custom shop editions existed. So it's a flame maple top Telecaster, right? You get two humbuckers on this thing, no more pick guards. It's still a string through style instrument, but look at these giant, once again, abalone inlays on this thing. That's a weird looking telly. But the best part about them, Look at that. They're set neck and they're actually sculpted heels too. They're very cool. If you want to check out something very similar to that, check out my Fender TC90 review and demo. That was an interesting guitar. And then there's also an Atkins signature version of that too. Now we've got a Photo Flame Telecaster. What I like about this is in the title, it's called Photo Flame. They're being honest. They're not trying to deceive you and call it a maple top. This is a picture of flame maple figuring on your guitar. Now I haven't actually had one in person to know if it's a legit photo or if it's like a veneer and it still moves. Judging by the photo, I don't think so, but this thing bugs me so bad because uh, they, it's off center. The, the photo's off center. <laughs> Well, if it's supposed to be a perfectly bookmatched two-piece top anyways. But that looks nice for a Telecaster. Like the white pick guard and all that. Wow. That's a good neck. I don't think they normally have necks like that. Looking at one other one here, maybe that is just a spec. Because that one's got a nice thing going on too. So maybe that's something I need to learn more about. Get one of these things in. Is the neck also a photo? Because if so, that's pretty cool. Next, I got a pair of Levinson mid-90s guitars. I just thought the finish was kind of interesting. It's like a reddish pink hue. You've got a lot of cool wood grain. The white pickups really contrast everything really well. Master volume, master tone looks like maybe even a split for your humbucker right there. And your regular five-way switch. Then the other one here is kind of like a, a take on a Jazz Master or Jaguar. I'm not sure which scale length it is. But you've got five single coils again, but just a little bit different. I'm sure they're acting as a humbucker. You can put them in series parallel and all that other stuff. But that one's got some cool wood grain too. And I, I would say I like this one better than the other one, just from the design aesthetic. Can't say the back does too much for me, nor does our headstock. Next, we've got a Rustomatic Steelcaster. This thing has some interesting vibes. Very rustic and aged looking. I love the fact that this whole distress job matches perfectly with the fretboard choice. You know they did that on purpose. They found the streaky rosewood board and it's like, all right, let's match that. And yeah, apparently it's made of metal. They even have the vented back plate here. Probably for weight relief would be my guess. That'd probably be pretty heavy otherwise. And so they can install all the other stuff. Not gonna say I know too much about this brand, but I have ran into them quite often. I like that red neck too. Next up here, we have a 2017 Paul Reed Smith. I thought this 10 top from PRS was pretty attractive looking because you've got that like nice whale blue finish. It's got a little bit of green in it and you get the matching mother of pearl inlays to the rest of that. And it even appears that the neck is ridiculously flamed. You don't see that as often on this particular model within PRS's lineup because I've actually had a few custom 24s, but they were just like baseline level, not ultra high-end custom shop limited edition special order stuff like this one. But then when we flip it over to the back, surprisingly plain. Now to be fair to this poor neck, white backdrop, not the best way to bring out the flame figuring in a neck, but you can see the beautiful mahogany body. Estimated somewhere around 2250 pounds. Which I don't know, that one might go for a little bit more because of the neck. 
Next up, we've got another SEPRS estimated between these prices. This was just a nice looking basic model. Like, can you imagine something like this? Their single cut shape, just straight up mahogany. Like there's no top or back or anything like that. It's just one solid block carved. That would be cool. I like the simplicity of the wrap tail piece and just having two P90 pickups. This is just looking good. We don't have any bird inlays or anything like that. It's just our dots. It looks like maybe real mother of pearl. And apparently they called this the SE soap bar. Now, when we get to the back, it's just starting to look a little bit more normal. But imagine this with like the Gibson Les Paul Access all heel carve. And once again, have this just be a one piece body all carved like I was talking about earlier in like a custom shop version. Then that would be an interesting bean shaped guitar. I'll have to keep my eye out for one of those. Looks like there's a, a cherry one right here. They were originally made in Korea just doesn't quite do it as well as that first one. Then we've got like a black burst version over here, which is strange because it looks completely black here and then actually burst to there. <laughs> it must be like some sort of a flip flop finish. This 2012 Ibanez AS153, for being a player friendly price, it looked to me like quite a beautiful piece. Now obviously you gotta get around Ibanez's obnoxiously large F-holes, but you know, it's a stylistic choice. I like the matching pick card that they've got going on, a little bit darker of a border. It also has at least some sort of a flame veneer on it with a matching body, but I love Ibanez's tail pieces. Those are so cool. The way that you can just put the string right down in there, not have to put it all the way through there, accidentally ding the ball <laughs> into the string on your guitar. And we've got those cool Mother of Pearl abalone mix inlays, or in this case, probably Pearloid to be my guess, but I'm not sure. Looks like this one even has some sort of a cheapy hard shell case. And oh, wow. Matching flame back, okay. But I said wow because I've never seen that before. That's interesting. Because normally you think have a burst here, burst up there, and then you have like the natural color here. But that one is different. I like it. Next, we have a 76 Ibanez Howard Roberts knockoff. This was a model that Gibson did, and this looks spot on. They did a great job on this. The inlay's a little bit off. I think they have the dashes in here a little bit too wide. It's especially prevalent up here. But for having no branding on it, it doesn't look half bad. Someone might get fooled by that. Interesting to see this from the side, just how much these pickups stick up because they get secured to the side of the neck. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.